Thank you, Thank everyone. You, everyone. Whoa. That was, that was We all good? Perfect. All right. Up from here, uh, welcome everyone to tonight's special city council meeting, Thursday, January 13th, 2022. Uh, I will be looking for a roll call. Mayor McEachern? Here. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Here. Councilor Tabor? It's present via Here. Zoom. Councilor Denton? Here. Councilor Morrow? Here. Councilor Bagley? Here. Councilor Lombardi? Here. Councilor Blaylock? Here. Councilor Cook? Here. All present, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, so I've called this meeting uh, to discuss the mask <laughs> directive um, and we'll be going through uh, public comment. The reason for this meeting is really uh, threefold. One, uh, to allow the public to weigh in uh, you'll notice uh, we're asking you to wear masks at the podium um, and on Zoom. Uh, we'll be going through specifically if you have not yet signed up, uh, we're going to limit to the people that have signed up. And if you are on Zoom, I need you to raise your hand uh, right now and we will mark you down as being able to, uh, to be able to speak. Do we already have the sign up sheet here? There's no sign up sheet in a special meeting. Not okay. For All right. We will not do that then. Um, uh, the focus is uh, hearing from the public, hearing from the council. Uh, this is something that uh, the council uh, hasn't discussed publicly uh, or amongst ourselves. Um, hearing from city attorney uh, when it comes to the legality of this issue. There's been a number of folks that have reached out uh, and like to touch on that. Um, and then finally, uh, we will go into uh, the need uh, for this, uh, the current state of health. And for that, I'm going to pass it over to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to speak about this. Uh, at the outset, I would like to say that um, this is a proud united front uh, on, the, on an important matter, essentially dealing with the public health of the citizens of Portsmouth. The health officer and I uh, work closely all the time. She and her team requested uh, the, the directive be issued, so I'd like to um, walk you through the rationale and the timing of that. So around December 28th, we began to see a rapid climb in weekly Portsmouth <coughs> percent positivity from just under 14 percent to just over 21 percent to now 27 percent. Rockingham County weekly positivity similarly jumped from 16 to 23 to now 25 percent. These increases were greater than we had any we had ever seen before throughout this pandemic, which is coming up on the two-year mark, and it occurred very rapidly. Time is and was of the essence to institute effective mitigation measures with the least amount of disruption, and masks are the best way to do this. Simply put, it was in the best interest of public health. We had a conversation with Mayor McKechnie, and he understood what we were doing. Uh, but let me keep going about um, why we feel that it was necessary. The CDC defines high transmission as 100 or more cases per 100,000 residents in the past seven days, and 8% or more test positivity. Today, New Hampshire DHHS reported a corrected new positive test result of 3,818 new cases. This is 38 times more new infections than is needed to reach the high transmission definition. Today, as mentioned earlier, the Portsmouth test positivity rate is 27.3%. The Portsmouth Regional Hospital is licensed for 191 inpatient beds and as of this morning <coughs> had an inpatient census of 203 with 27 patients holding in the emergency department for an admit for a bed. Similarly, Wentworth Douglas and Exeter hospitals are on surge capacity and both are operating under their crisis incident command and capacity management command structures. Just to put this in perspective, Exeter hospital also has 143 staff members out. So at the request of the health officer, we issued the public health directive, which took effect on Friday, January 7th. And um, we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. With me tonight is not only the health officer, Kim McNamara, but our emergency management coordinator, Fire Chief Todd Germain. 
So at this point, I'll open it up to the council if there are questions of the city manager or of Councilor Blaylock. Um, yeah, so I've, these numbers are all very high. Um, and right now, I think most people are home testing. I don't know if everyone is reporting those home, the results of those home tests to these numbers. Um, would it be my understanding that these numbers might even be higher? because people are, are, are required to self-report? That is correct. <clears throat> it is widely anticipated these numbers are very low compared to what we are actually seeing. Councilor Cook. Uh, City Manager, could you uh, please explain the understanding on, in the RSA on why, we, why you issued ultimately this directive and what the legality is behind it? That's a question I keep getting from right. a lot of members of the community. I would ask uh, the city attorney to weigh in. Sure. And there are any number of ways in which uh, the city could approach the issue of, of uh, compelling or requiring citizens to wear face masks. Uh, the, uh, the circumstance at the moment on January 7th was that uh, the health officer felt that we needed to act as quickly as possible. That was a major factor in decision making because one of the alternative methods to adopting the public health directive would have been for the city council to adopt an ordinance, for example. That would have probably taken, at that time, without calling special meetings, a month. And the health officer didn't feel that the public health risk allowed us to wait a month. Um, the order that you see in front of you was uh, adopted uh, at the recommendation of the city's legal department after studying the question as being the fastest way that we could act. Council Murrow. Um, city Attorney Sullivan, could you just, I guess, walk us through why the choice to go under this specific statute instead of using the one under communicable diseases, which does have a policy of allowing health agents, the agents of the Commissioner of Health, to be able to, you know, take measures in which to be able to do that. So, As I said, there are a number of approaches. That's one. Ordinance by the council will be another. Um, we looked at the statute on the 7th and felt this fit the situation, and we could act literally within hours. We have Councilors Tabor and Bagley with their hands raised, Mayor. Councillor Tabor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'm 100% in support of this. Um, we look, uh, I think we discussed this the week between Christmas and New Year's in City Hall, and, and uh, I remember the City Attorney uh, pointing out this was a way we could go. Um, and we didn't have a regularly scheduled meeting until January 24th. So it would have potentially taken us a long time, three readings to get an ordinance done. And, uh, you know, two other compelling reasons. If you look at the number of cases in the state, we had five, um, Christmas week was 561. Last week was 1,291. The current year average weekly, 2,610. And then we just heard the, the alarming figure of nearly 3,800, so um, really moving fast. And uh, I'm not with you tonight because I tested positive. Um, I was in a group and 7% of us uh, got the virus from one person. And that's what people can expect if they are indoors in a group. Um, that's how rapidly it spreads. And uh, the mask ordinance, uh, we know masks will slow the spread and um, it will keep a lot of people safe. Councillor Bagley. Um, yes, I, I am also not there tonight because I tested positive for COVID earlier in the week. Um, just uh, my symptoms uh, appeared at night and I tested and, and unlike the stories that I've been reading the news, I tested positive right away. I didn't have to wait a couple of days um, tomorrow's my last day of isolation. I think 
the the question I have is, it sounds like most, if not all of the counselors are in support of this action. Is there anything we can do as a council to codify it, to back it up, to give it the support it needs? My hope is that we only need this for a few number of weeks, um, possibly maybe four to six weeks and the surge happens and then it falls off like has happened in uh, South Africa and sounds like the UK. Um, but I, I'd like to know, is there a good mechanism for us to show our support um, of this important measure? Your Honor, uh, the uh, City Council support is not expressly required. Uh, this action is action of the health officer taken uh, under her authority uh, and based upon uh, her perception of the public health risk. However, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it isn't required, uh, I think that if the council is uh, supportive of the actions of the health officer and the city manager in this matter, I think a vote to that effect would be perhaps comforting to the citizens of the city to know that the chief policy-making body of the city feels the same as the health officer. Councilor Blaylock. Um, yes, I, I'm in support of um, starting a mask mandate or leading by example. I think it's important for us to lead by example. I think it's important to show that we support the decision made by the uh, health officer. Um, I also think it's really important. I had the unique experience of running a restaurant during a pandemic. And sometimes it's an 18-year-old girl up against a very angry customer. Um, and I would like to give that 18 year old hostess or host some support in making a healthy decision. So I think this is really important um, for those instances and also to protect our um, healthcare workers and anyone on the front lines. Um, I think it's really important we protect our health. Councilor Morrow. Um, I, I am in support of this. I wanna make sure that we've done it legally and defendable. Um, as a business owner, I actually two days before this came out had already posted a notice in my office. But at the same time, I'm gonna have people show up that are going to refuse to, and I'm probably not gonna make them just because I don't feel that, I absolutely can if they say they have some sort of medical issue or meet the exemption, whether I can prove it or not is one thing. But at the same time, I think it is the only way that we're actually going to be able to protect those in the community that are unable to be vaccinated, whether due to timing or whatever the case may be. So I think until this is, our numbers are more under control or we can finally get past this as depressing as it is, um, I think this is what we need to do. Councilor Cook. Thank you, Mayor. I also am in support of this uh, ordinance. Um, and I have a, an unusual perspective on this because I've spent the last few years married to a healthcare professional through the pandemic. And I've watched the numbers fluctuate. I've watched his concern. And right now we're at the worst point in the pandemic for Seacoast, New Hampshire. And people are not getting the healthcare that they need right now because surgeries are being delayed, care is being delayed care for other things other than COVID. And that means that our residents, you know, when we're in the middle of a surge, our residents aren't getting um, all the services they need. They're getting deferred care. That means longer issues that, that continue on for them in the long run. And it means more strain on our healthcare system and our healthcare workers. Um, I think it's urgent that we support um, the city manager that we show our support for the city manager and the health officer. Assistant Mayor. I also support this directive. My question is for um, the health officer and the city manager. When we look at these numbers, and we're talking about obviously the, um, the mask mandate, where are we looking at to what, where do the numbers need to be so that we can be comfortable enough to drop the directive? Obviously, it's always recommended um, it is, we are in a pandemic, um, but I'm just looking at where, so I know there's a lot of people that have questions of when will, you know, good enough, you know, be? Well, that's a complex question, but a great one. Uh, so 
the the thought was brought up earlier that a lot of at-home tests are not being counted and so when we look at percent positivity it is artificially low and it's going to grow to be more artificially low so that one metric itself is not something that we can look at solely but we are concerned about our hospitalization rates our hospitals are on surge um, they're over capacity and that creates other additional problems, um, not just with the pandemic and treating our ordinary citizens, but if we had a, a disaster uh, on top of that. So we look at the hospitalizations, we look at the death rate from COVID, different variants um, have different death rates and hopefully that will be lower if it's Omicron that's coming through, which at this point that seems to be what the wave is. So we're looking at all of those data points. I've spoken to the area hospitals about this exact question because it's a very important one. And the, the thinking is, is you've just got to stay on top of the variables and understand the situation. But my hope is that these numbers will begin to drop rather rapidly if there's that many infections in the community. And if a good majority of people are wearing masks, we should see those numbers come down. Um, if we were going to rely on a percentage of test positivity, we would probably align with the schools, which is at 8% is when you can drop the requirement and that's also what the CDC says is moderate transmission. So we're out of that high and substantial transmission. Thank you. Okay. Uh, before we get to a motion uh, to support oh. this. Sorry, Councilor. Oh, we Council have. Council Lombardi wants to speak. Oh, oh. Councilor <clears throat> Lombardi. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Honorable Mayor. I uh, will say right off that I, I support this motion and that um, I think that one of the concerns is, of course, enforcement and how that works. Um, who, who enforces it? Is it up to every individual, every business, every what? So it's just a question that uh, I've been asked on this. So uh, I wonder about enforcement. Councilor Lombardi, if, if the uh, city attorney could address that, that would be amenable. Sure. And the question is, enforcement. You wonder about enforcement. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> well, I'm not sure exactly uh, what part of enforcement you're wondering about, but the enforcement mechanism is <clears throat> twofold, really. Um, first off, the violation of a public health directive from the health officer is itself a violation as, as described in state law, which is just a civil infraction, a little bit lower than the lowest level of crime. Uh, and, and secondly, in any place inside this building, for example, if uh, a person was instructed by the authority uh, controlling the building, in this case the city manager, if the person was instructed to wear a mask and that person chose not to wear a mask, uh, that would be trespass under state law and a person could be prosecuted for, and a summons and prosecuted for trespass. So those are the enforcement mechanisms. But the most important thing about this is the whole business of the health directive is not about enforcement and not about punishment, it's about education. The city's health officer who by very significant education and very significant experience, the city's health officer has made a determination that the protection of the public health calls for the public health directive to wear the mask. That's what's important, not really enforcement. It's important that the people know that the woman that they pay to make these decisions is saying you should be wearing a mask. And that's really the most important aspect of the whole discussion. So uh, before we go to public comment, and I would like to go have public comment uh, before we vote on any uh, motion that we might receive, uh, and we will need a motion uh, in order to, to vote on it. Uh, I would like to state my support for this directive. Um, and my support for the way in which it was implemented. Um, I believe in how we do good government here in Portsmouth. That's for the nine of us on the dais and unfortunately for in the internet somewhere uh, speaking with us to come together and direct policy towards 
uh, the city manager. But a policy that goes without saying is that we want to keep our citizens safe. Uh, that is a fundamental responsibility of government. It's why we choose to come together in community. It's, it's why we have fire departments, police departments, and health officers. And we had had the conversation at the last council. If uh, Kim could uh, uh, do this herself, then she should. Uh, the percent positivity is now, we talk about eight uh, as a number to get back to. That was where we were in December 21st. We are now at uh, nearly 30%, at 27.7%. It is going up rapidly, uh, and I trust our uh, city staff to make the decisions that we put them in the position to make. Uh, so with that, I want to open public comment. I ask that we keep uh, to three minutes first, uh, and if we could uh, line up, since obviously it's a special meeting and there's no uh, sign-up sheet, uh, we will Limited to three minutes, um, we ask that Portsmouth residents uh, go first. We will move through the, uh, the in-persons, and then for those that have already had their hands up, we will move through uh, the Zoom uh, attendees. Just remember, you, when you come up, you need to state your name and your address. Brian, come on up. Good evening, uh, uh, Mayor McEachern and the City Council. I would like to commend the City Council. Brian, just really quick, I need your oh, name and oh, your address. Sure. Brian Wazler, 89 Sagamore Avenue. And good evening, folks. I'd like to commend the City Council, the City Manager, and the City Health Officer for creating a public health directive on uh, wearing, fa uh, wearing face cover coverings in publicly accessible indoor areas. And as you are aware, we are experiencing a COVID Omicron surge in New Hampshire. And just as it was mentioned, we, we have a positivity rate of 27%. We have, we have over 22,000 active cases in the state of New Hampshire. In addition, uh, hospitals are feeling a surge from COVID. We have doctors and nurses from the U.S. Army. We have doctors and nurses from FEMA. And we have health professionals from the New Hampshire National Guard. In addition, two days ago, a deployment of 25 guardsmen was sent to the New Hampshire State Prison due to a COVID outbreak among the uh, correction officers. So it, it, the, the surge is with us, and, and what folks are saying, it's only going to get worse. Uh, to combat COVID, there, there are two neutral tracks, and one we all know about is, is, is a vaccination. Get vaccinated. That's the best way to combat COVID. Uh, the other track is, is public health mitigation, and one uh, area of public health mitigation is the wearing of face coverings. Face coverings will uh, reduce the viral load, will reduce the transmission of COVID. In addition, they also reduce the infection rate from COVID. So face coverings are good. Face coverings are the way to go. They're a good public health mitigation effort. And uh, I think the directive uh, is great, and I think the directive uh, promotes the health and welfare of our neighbors, our friends, our relatives, and, and the citizens of Portsmouth. And just one other thing, I just noticed downtown the other day, there was a sign at one business that said, no shirts, no shoes, no masks, no service. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Bill Downey, 67 Bow Street. Congratulations to everyone who won. Um, I am all in support of this initiative. I thank the city manager. Um, personally, I've been wearing a mask for at least 60 days since it got cold, so uh, I'm very much in support of this. Uh, all due respect, uh, Mr. Sullivan, this is two years into it. I think education, pretty, people pretty much are on a side right now, and I appreciate the law enforcement's position as well as private business owners but we don't get to choose whether we wear a seatbelt. We don't get to choose whether we accost somebody. And I think that I would hope that the city and the police force would anticipate the next level of challenges on this, because I think it's that important. Um, moving on to one of my favorite topics, the McIntyre. Um, I just have several questions for the city attorney, city manager, and the mayor. Um, is this permitted, by the way? I don't think so. Okay. We've got to speak That's to this. Me. Yeah, uh, this is a special meeting for the uh, directive or the health directive. So um, we can take that up at the next uh, the next uh, uh, public comment opportunity or please email the council your questions and we'll work to get them answered. You got it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. 
Hello, uh, my name is Alan Forbes. I'm at 36 Harrison Avenue, um, and I'm opposed to the mask mandate. And um, the first point that I want to make is that I think that in and of itself, this rate of infection is not a public health risk. Um, if you look at some of the data, and I pulled a lot of data off of the New Hampshire um, state you know, COVID dashboard this morning, one of the things that it said was, since this whole crisis has started, we've had 233,508 cases in the state and 2,051 deaths. That gives you a death rate of just under a tenth of a percent. So our survival rate is 99.1%. Uh, most of those deaths, if you look at, at the chart, uh, come from the early part of the crisis, and you can see that the the cases really kind of went down very dramatically once we figure out how to treat people. <clears throat> and those cases are going down uh, even more as the various strains come out. Um, of those 251 deaths, sorry, <laughs> uh, a th over a thousand of them were people who are already in long-term care facilities. And if you've ever been to one of those, uh, they're pretty miserable places. Uh, most of those people have other issues going on and COVID was the thing that kind of pushed them over the edge, but it was not the thing that really, you know, uh, brought the end for them. Uh, just this past Friday on Good Morning America, the director of the CDC said that the overwhelming number of deaths, over 75% of them occurred in people who have at least four comorbidities, so they're people that are unwell to begin with. And my point of bringing those things up is that healthy people, which is like everybody in this room here and all of you are not dying from this. You know, we're getting sick. You know, have two counselors that are uh, positive cases right now seem perfectly, don't seem like they're at risk of dying to me. Now, all the people who I know that have this complain that they have a little cold and they're fine uh, a little bit later. I think this whole thing is an exercise in alarmism and it really needs to stop. You know, COVID cases, yes, they're increasing, but it's not the same COVID that we started out with. Uh, Kaiser Permanente did a study that just came out two days ago that said um, with this new Omicron variant, it's a 53% reduction in hospitalization compared to Delta, which was even less than the first one. If you do go to the hospital, you have a 74% less chance of going into the ICU and you have a 91% reduction in mortality. So I did some of the math um, and that is, you know, if the first, um, the first one we had at less than a tenth of a percent of, of dying from it, and this new one is 90% even less, then what is it exactly that we're being protected from? I don't understand it. Thank you, Alan. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, counselors. Congratulations to the new counselors. Uh, my name is Greg Mahana. I live at Four Hoover Drive in Portsmouth. Welcome to City Council. I will read carefully and paraphrase actual city and state documents. Not my opinions. I'm going to read from city and state documents. The health directive, which is dated January 7, 2022, at the request of the health officer, which this takes effect immediately. Further down, per public health directive, accordingly effective January 7th, 2022. Next, paraphrasing, in all publicly accessible indoor areas. Interesting paragraph. A face covering is not required for any person with a medical or developmental condition to whom the wearing of the face covering would pose a threat to their health or safety, including anxiety, period. The individual shall not be required to pr produce documentation or any other evidence to verify such conditions, period. This goes on to say, the last paragraph, the directive is authorized by the Portsmouth City Manager, which is the analogous position in Portsmouth to the selectman referenced in the statute. I'm quoting. Now I'll read you RSA 147.1. And I'll paraphrase this, which shall take effect when approved by the selectman recorded by the town clerk and published in some newspaper printed by the town. Counselors are selectmen. That's analogous. Counselors and selectmen. 
counselors make policy. Counselors, the January 7th directive was done in violation of both city and state statutes. I find it interesting during the discussion that both Councilors Bagley and Councilor Moreau questioned the procedure of this. Next, I'll read from the city charter, section 1.3, general structure. I'll read it in its entirety. All departments, officers, and individuals referred to in this charter shall operate as one municipal corporation. The governing body of the municipality shall be the city council. The city council shall be the policy-making entity of the city except for where this charter expressly otherwise allocates policy-making authority. The chief administrative officer of the city shall be the city manager who shall have the decision-making authority to carry out policies of the city council. You can read for yourself section five, which gives the responsibilities of the city ma manager. I don't have time for that. Councilors, this is the beginning of your two-year term. For this council to be effective and successful, I suggest that you follow the structure of our charter. You work for the citizens of the city of Portsmouth and the city manager works for you. Regardless of where the council rules tonight on this, please begin to observe the city of Portsmouth structure as outlined in the city of Portsmouth charter. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Hi, I'm Marie Nelson and I live at 20 Doris Ave in Portsmouth. And thank you very much for having this public comment because um, I work in um, the restaurant industry and I also work in a gym in this city. And my daughter, who's 15, she works at a restaurant in this city. And um, I've been wearing my mask all along since day one. Um, I continue to wear my mask and um, since this directive came out last week, I talk, to, I talk to hundreds of people a day in the line of work I do and I don't think that we're headed in the right direction of thinking that other people care for one another. It's a nice idea, it's all in good intention, but it's not coming off that way because there's no repercussions with this and there is no enforcement. And unfortunately, I believe that the police are full with what they've got going on. And I think if we were better across the board with the decision, it would be better for everyone. Because dealing with the people that are irate about wearing the mask or not wearing the mask, it's, it's overwhelming, and it's overwhelming to a 22-year-old waitress that's looking for a tip to tell somebody that they need to put a mask on. I think it's a lot to ask from, for people. And with the, with the exemption of anxiety, that it's a, it's a well-intended thing as well, but I think that we're getting away from what the masks are doing. So um, I just hope that you all are on the same page when this is all said and done. It's for the right of the people. So thank you. Thank you, Murray. Hello, this is Sue Polidura uh, to 45 Middle Street. And I had some questions once I uh, was aware that there was this directive in place. Is it? What is the difference between a directive and a mandate? When is this directive going to uh, go away? Uh, why was it not brought before the city council? Call an emergency meeting if you have to. Right now, there is no state of emergency because of COVID in New Hampshire. There is no state of emergency because of COVID on Rockingham County. It demanded to have the consensus of our elected officials to bring this in place and have it be a, a, a better accepted mandate. I found out because I was in Whole Foods and some 20 year old came chasing after me for me to get a mask. I was there just to get some carrots. I really don't need this and neither do you. What a, what a directive is going to do is I'm gonna say, well, this is just a directive. All right, well, I'm not following the directive. What are you gonna do about it? 
Many people are going to take that, and it's, it's going to be up to them. This is creating more confusion that it has meant to address. I'm I getting confusing news on the television. Medical professionals telling that cloth mask and nothing more than a decoration because they don't seem to fill any kind of purpose. The only ones that seem to do anything are the N95 masks. Are we going to mandate that? It, this is a very, it, it's a very delicate situation here with this mandates versus requirements versus directives. I don't anticipate that you will vote it down, but it's like we, we need to bring the council and, and start looking at this. I have a copy of the RSA, the, uh, of, the, um, of the ordinance that was passed when this COVID started by the previous council, and it was, there is a resolution in there. They do the whereas, and because it was a state of emergency going on in the state of New Hampshire, they went and did that. It was, they gave themselves guidelines to how to address it, how to enforce it pretty much. Um, they don't want to create a mass police. Maybe you can bring this back. This was done, ordinance 03-2020. Maybe it's just as simple as that. What I am opposed to just doing this off the cuff, drop it off, and all of a sudden have all of these kids trying to enforce this on people that I, they don't know what the heck is going on. So anyways, this is my feeling. I was a little upset about that. And I think that a lot of the other people, what this is gonna do is gonna take away, bringing it on, taking it off, is going to just be led to the crying wolf and people will ignore it after a while. Thank you, Sue. Good evening, Mayor McEachern and Council. Good evening. Um, I'm not here to speak Teacher, for oh, 280 please. South Street. Thank you. I'm not here to, to, to speak to, for or against this directive. I'm here to call attention to the process that was taken. Um, I believe there was inaccurate statements made in this directive. And I don't believe the law that it's, you're looking at one number RSA 147.1 is for town. The form of government that was, that was um, referenced here is for selectmen. And in the last note on here, which was a little upsetting to me, this directive is authorized by the Portsmouth City Manager, which is an analogous position with the Portsmouth, with the, to Portsmouth with a selectman in the statute. Uh, we are a, uh, we are a city council, city manager, governed body. That's in our charter. This is a false statement. Um, to, to put this out here and um, not have any clarification <clears throat> on that is false. Um, the putting of the directive out goes against the charter number section number 1.3 general structure it goes against the powers of the council number 4.2 and it also is described of the duties of the city manager in 5.3 the, also the process that was followed here by I don't have any problem with the process with the health officer at all um, in the paper when I since I, I'm not privy to any of this information anymore, when I see that the, the city manager, through this power that was suggested, just conferred with the, with the uh, mayor and the city council, uh, it's very distressing as it goes against the charter. Um, I, I guess I would, would ask that it, it, it didn't seem clear to me that the council is all on the same page as to what they're voting on tonight. We had some mandates, we had some directives. Um, I would ask you to clarify this to the citizens and the residents as to what you are actually trying to put in place here. And I would also um, ask Bob to uh, look at number 
and look at what a selectman is in reference to this and what the city charter says of Portsmouth as to who should be looking at this. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'm Ken Riley, 5 Hoover Drive. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to cite any statutes here, but I will read something that it took me a, a, a significant time to write for you. It'll only be a minute or two. Basically, I don't understand the decision to re-implement the mask mandate in Portsmouth, even though it is not required per the state. A large portion of the population in Portsmouth with 74% with one vaccination, 66% fully vaccinated. The mask, the mask mandate is for all individuals, regardless of vaccination status. Why are the vaccinated people being punished along with the unvaccinated people by the mask mandate? Why can't the town allow businesses to let fully vaccinated individuals into their businesses without a mask since they've complied with the nationwide call to get the vaccinations? The requirements to get the vaccination for any business over 100 people has already been mandated on the federal level, however challenged in the Supreme Court and held up already. How are we going to get the number of cases of COVID under control unless there is more incentive to get the vaccine, as in no mask required if you're vaccinated? Seems simple to me. Target the people who don't want to get the vaccine and leave the vaccinated alone. Also, the mandate allows, uh, this is from the uh, directive, I just quoted a bit of it. Also, the mandate allows gymnasiums that have instituted other mitigation me uh, measures such as vaccination requirements, physical distancing, or enhanced ventilation system to not require masks. Yet the Planet Fitness, where I go, on Lafayette requires masks for everyone, even when they're, work even when they're working on the machines. When the mask mandate went into effect last year, it seems that all businesses were going out of their way to think of more and more restrictions on our lives. Evidence the way uh, one-way aisles in the stores, plexiglass barriers, and removing all benches from the urban forestry center. It seems that once the mandate snowball starts to roll, it continues to roll until the city shuts it down. There is no mechanism in place to prevent the over-enthusiastic growth of restrictions once the mandate is implemented. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Rick Beckstead, 1395 Isman Street. I want to uh, say congratulations to the mayor and to the council, and I feel extremely sorry that you all have to live what the previous council had gone through. Uh, maybe to even more of an extreme. I was really in hopes that you would never have to. It was been an unbearing two years, and I would wish this on no one. Um, it, just a, a, a few brief things when it comes to some of the people going and saying. Um, I do agree as far as the fact that the RSA is meant for cities, or towns, not cities. Um, that is something that really should be. If this council goes and takes it, I would feel more comfortable that my elected officials, I did vote for two people that are actually on the council today, believe it or not, um, I would hope that the elected body would make that decision and not the city manager and not uh, the health director. Uh, my question is, is when we lived through this, um, we were in unknown realms. We had no vaccine. You know, the last speaker went and said that literally nearly almost 70% of our residents have gone and taken it upon themselves to do the right thing. So what is the right thing here to go and do? Because this mandate, this directive will hurt businesses. We have two people that have families uh, or owners of businesses. Now, I attended on the 28th an event at the uh, uh, music hall, and they did a wonderful job. So uh, you got to choose as far as whether you wanted to wear a mask or not, but you had to have a vaccine card in order to be able to enter. This mandate actually takes away that choice, which could hurt businesses. Now, businesses and economics should be our number one priority when it comes to this in a lot of ways because we're in the winter. We're not a four-season town, and we're not. We're a three-season town. This is when they need us the most. There's no more money coming. The government's not printing anymore. It's done. We need to look at all the objectives. If anything, I would go and say that we would re-implement the mass mandate that we had gone and put in place. This would require two special meetings that could be called back to back within 36 hours notice. And then you could have a proper, uh, I guess, public comment 
I want to hear from the Chamber of Commerces. I want to hear from other businesses, not reading through the paper and stuff like that. This would give the businesses the ability to go and give their views. I mean, this meeting here, I greatly appreciate, uh, Mayor McEachern, um, at least to have some kind of foresight. But at the same time, your elected officials are supposed to represent all of us. And I get it backing up Kim McNamara. I mean, she did a wonderful job. But if everyone looks back when we went and revoked the previous mandate, Kim McNamara's recommendation was to continue it for 30 days. We had to keep the businesses up and going. We had to thrive again. Your job as elected officials is to weigh both options. And I'm going to ask you tonight to do that. Go ahead and continue as far as with what's here. Have the discussion. Have two special meetings. Have a real public hearing so that the businesses and the public can go and weigh in so you can make a conscious decision. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. We have nine names on Zoom, Mayor. Okay. So we'll move to the first one. Okay. Martha Wassel, please go ahead. State your address. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Martha Wassel. My address is 11 Salt Marsh Lane in Greenland, New Hampshire. Right, Martha, I'm here Martha? tonight hey, Martha, as uh, the Martha, director Martha, please... of infection person. Martha, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we have to, we're going to go through uh, Citizens Portsmouth first. Uh, if you could keep your hand raised, we'll come back to you. Next up is Rich DePentima. Go ahead, Rich. Please give us your address. Go ahead, Rich. You need to unmute yourself. Okay, we'll go to. Yep, uh, we'll go to Nicole. Okay. Up here. Oh, you're there. Go you ahead, hear me Rich. Now. All right. Okay, uh, Rich Deepentima from 16 Dunlin Way, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I'd like to speak in favor of the directive issued by the city manager and the health officer. As a former chief of New Hampshire's Division of uh, Epidemiology, retired epidemiologist and a member of the city's Blue Ribbon Health Committee. I want to express my deep gratitude and support for the courageous and bold actions by the city manager, Kennard, and health officer McNamara to help protect our city residents, workers, and visitors. New Hampshire RSA 141C is the New Hampshire statute regarding communicable diseases. Is the law that directs the policy of the state should follow to combat communicable diseases. It states in part, the outbreak and spread of communicable diseases cause unnecessary risks to the health and life, interfere with the orderly workings of business, industry, government, and the process of education, and disrupt the daily day-to-day -day affairs of communities and citizens. Because the control of communicable diseases may be attained by personal actions the timely intervention of medical practices and cooperation among health care providers, federal, state, and municipal officials, and other groups and agencies. It is hereby declared to be the policy of this state that communicable diseases be prevented and that such occurrences be identified, controlled, and when possible, eradicated at the earliest possible time by application of appropriate public health measures, and medical practices. This law was written in 1986. How prophetic. Unfortunately, the governor, the executive council, the executive departments of the state, and the legislature have not complied with their own law and have even taken steps to contradict it. As such, it is up to the individual communities to fill this void by taking the necessary action as was done by our health officer and our health department and our city manager. I request that the city council adopt a resolution this evening that supports and endorses the city manager and health officers public health mass directive. And be advised that death is not the most largest kind of problem we face with this disease. With the number of cases we're seeing, we're seeing many people suffer from long haul COVID disease. Just this week, the CDC re released a report 
on the number of increased cases of type 1 and type 2 diabetes among children who had mild or even asymptomatic infection. We've seen many cases of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in individuals who've had either minor or asymptomatic infection. There are a number of unknown situations that may yet develop with this disease because we do not know the natural history of this disease. We've only seen it for two years. There may be many other complications that will arise in those who are infected with this virus, even if they had mild or even asymptomatic infection. So we need to do everything possible to prevent as many infections as possible because we do not know what the consequences will be down the road, not only death, but other long-term chronic conditions that will affect many people. Thank you for your attention. Next, we have Nicole up here. Please give us your address. Good evening. Nicole up here, 44 Rock Street. 843 Americans have died in a two, 843,000, excuse me, Americans have died in this two year period of COVID. To diminish this loss in any way is unforgivable. And to anyone that does, clearly you have not lost a loved one or you are not capable of empathy. It's equally maddening and sad. As Omnicron, this is from today's NPR, as Omnicron drives COVID-19 cases and hospital hospitalizations to new highs, our healthcare systems are struggling to handle the surge. Nationally, COVID-19 hospitalizations have reached record highs. The stat shared by city manager uh, Kennard at the beginning of the meeting regarding regional hospitals are disturbing and the personal account by Councilor Cook is compelling. Not having this directive is destroying our hospitals. People cannot get standard care because of it. I want to thank uh, city manager Kennard and Kim McNamara for acting quickly. I 100% this health direct 100% support this health directive. There was no time to waste. Public safety comes for any charter or bylaws in my opinion. I work in a high school and from the countless exposures I have had in the past years, I assure you that masks work. And to the new city council, congratulations. You certainly have your work cut out for you. Tonight proves that. And with great expectations, I wish you the best. And one final note, forgive me. If you want businesses to stay open, wear a mask and get vaccinated. It's common sense. If you are in a store, you can wear a mask. If you are at a restaurant, when you are not eating, you can wear a mask. If you don't, in a surge, you put our economy at risk. I just wanted to make that point to one of the speakers. Thank you, and I wish you all the best and good health. Thank you, Nicole. Next, we have Pat Bagley. Please go ahead, Pat, and give us your address. Yes, Pat Bagley, uh, 213 Pleasant Street. Um, I am fully supportive of this directive. I uh, thank the city manager and and the health officer, uh, Kim McNamara. I've actually uh, missed hearing from, from Kim over the last few months. Um, and. Uh, I relied upon upon her guidance uh, during um, the first and second surges. Um, I've actually lost count of how many surges we've had. Um, I had an experience shopping at Christmas time, and I limited my shopping to very few stores. But I went into one shop, and they had a mask requirement sign on the uh, front door. And I saw the owner inside, whom I hadn't seen in two years, and I thanked her for the directive and um, or the requirement. And she stopped what she was doing and thanked me for my support because I guess she had taken a lot of grief for asking for uh, people to wear masks. So I just, I felt as, as though I were, I were safer in her environment and I went back and shopped there a couple of times after. Um, the, I don't, agree that uh, I know there's a lot of dissension about the city manager 
operating outside of her realm. Um, I know this isn't protocol, um, but this pandemic is not following protocol. And I believe that um, the city council should support this motion. I think they will. And um, you have my support. Um, I don't expect this to be an ongoing thing. And I um, thank you for your time and for listening. Thank you, Pat. And good luck to all of you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Next, we have William Holscher. William, please give us your address. 777 Middle Road. I've been sitting here listening, and I sent a correspondence to the council, to the mayor, in the state legislature, primarily because what I saw in this directive really was appalling. I want to just step back for a second and understand what this council is. You are representing the people, the people of Portsmouth, not the state, not some Rockland County, the people of Portsmouth. I have not heard one statistic that reflects Portsmouth. Physical counts for Portsmouth. I've heard percentages. I've heard context. I've heard very little corresponding content and statistics. You need to make decisions based on facts. And you need to have those facts into proper context. Case in point. Let me read you the title of chapter 147, one. Nuisances, toilets, drains, exploration, rubbish and waste. Local regulations. That was passed by the state to cover those areas. You extracted a paragraph from that statute and claimed it went way beyond that area and covered communicable diseases. You quote state numbers, national numbers, and yet you're not concerned about just Portsmouth. Businesses are being hurt. People are leaving the town to go shopping elsewhere. I've seen it firsthand because of this. You bypassed your own rules. You did not even follow proper procedure, nor were you interested in the rights of the people of this city? You have the right, we have the right to a transparent government. You should have published that entire RSA 147-1 as it was written to let people see that you were taking a paragraph out of there which covered nuisances, toilets, drains, expiration, rubbish, and waste not communicable diseases. That's a state and a federal jurisdiction, not a city. I hope that as a new council, you put things in proper context and content. And it's not one versus the other. Let WMUR news and open newspapers play with the numbers. Thank you, William. To put an ideology or an agenda forward. I am not for this directive, not because of what it's trying to do, but because how it was done. Thank it you, Dan. I'm just muted. Go ahead. Next, we have Ann Berner. Ann, please give us your address. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. I'm calling in from 77 State Street here in Fort Smith. I want to express my deep gratitude for and support of the decisive and speedy action taken by the city manager under the advisement of our city public health officer. I'd like to thank the mayor and counselors who have made the statements of support. I would also like to say that I was very appreciative when the last city council passed the mask mandate but I was frustrated by the amount of time it took to get that mandate into place. So I do understand the need for speed and dispatch and, and very appreciative of the way this was undertaken. I'd like to uh, send my best wishes for the good health to all who've been affected, including those of you on the council who are calling in because of your positivity tonight. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Next, we have Derek Hayward. Please give us your address. Hello, my name is Derek Hayward, and I currently live at 105 Nathaniel Drive. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate the new mayor and the new councillors, and I'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity to share my comments tonight. Um, I'm here as a citizen of Portsmouth that respectfully disagrees with the city's mask mandate, and I have several reasons for not supporting this mandate. This past November, I tested positive for COVID along with my wife and our son, who was six months at the time. We experienced mild symptoms comparable to the common cold, and we all quarantined for the recommended 10 days. After having experienced COVID firsthand, I feel stronger than ever that every person should be able to prepare their bodies and manage COVID however they feel is best for them and their families. If someone feels like a mask is going to provide them with another layer of protection, then I believe those people should have every right to wear a mask. If someone feels like the pros of wearing a mask do not outweigh the cons, or if they feel like there is not a high enough level of risk to require wearing a mask, I do not think we should be requiring those people to put a mask on their face. Since March of 2020, we have heard contradicting statements on masks, how effective they are, and if they should be required. I believe we are at a point where people should be trusted to do what they feel is best for their own health and their family's health. We have been living with this virus long enough to be able to process the information that has been given to us and make our own decisions. There are plenty of studies that say that masks prevent the spread of germs. However, there are also plenty of studies that show that masks can have negative consequences as well, both mentally and physically. Not only is this impacting our adult population, but the psychological impact that masks have caused to the development of children is unmeasurable at this time, and it is sure to cause negative impacts that will disrupt the natural trajectory of a child's social development. It is great that the city wants to support good health for their citizens, but I do not believe their support should translate to mandates. During these times, I think we should explore all facets of our health so our bodies are prepared for whatever comes our way, whether that is the food we put into our body, the frequency in which we exercise, or understanding the elements of our blood work like vitamin D, which is a key piece of our immune system. I hope that our city leaders will reevaluate the mask mandate and make decisions that empower the citizens of Portsmouth to handle their individual health how they feel best. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you, Derek. Next is Lori McRae. Lori, please give us your address. First of all, can, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Lori McRae, 15 Haven Road in Portsmouth. Uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, on behalf of my son and myself, I really want to thank you for this opportunity to offer my public support regarding the City's requirement that persons over the age of five appropriately, appropriately wear face coverings within the City limits, um, effective last week. Uh, is this directive perfect? I think we all know no, but is this directive absolutely necessary at this point in time? And I would argue 100% yes. I am a registered nurse and I have a Master of Science degree from the University of New Hampshire in Nursing Administration. And over the course of my career, I've worked in intensive care units, emergency departments, and as a home health nurse. I have seen firsthand disease and death from respiratory-based illnesses, some like COVID that could be prevented or mitigated through proper personal or public health practices. We must take measures not only to protect individuals but to prevent the breakdown of our healthcare system from this pandemic. As was mentioned earlier, all we need is one more crisis to throw us um, into havoc. We all know one of the most important responsibilities of government is to protect the public health and safety, and we all have to breathe the air. None of us should have to risk unnecessary exposure to this pandemic virus when we are out and about, no matter who is in our presence. Lastly, thank you to our public health officer, Kim McNamara, and also our city manager, Karen Kennard, for their leadership uh, by issuing this health directive at the time that it was needed to protect public health. And I also just really want to thank our new council and our mayor for your support of this public health directive. And thank you to the residents who have spoken before me tonight also in support. I am very deeply appreciative. Thank you. Next, we have Judy Miller. Judy, please give us your address. Hi, uh, Judy Miller at 77 Hanover Street. Um, I do support this um, wearing of masks. Um, I do shop locally, and I, I do feel that um, the residents of Portsmouth do support our businesses. Um, I disagree with 
another speaker who feels that people are leaving Portsmouth to go shopping. Um, I think we should come together as a community. Every law that has been cited or regulation or chapter were all created before a worldwide pandemic is occurring. So I think we need to support the city council in this endeavor. I should also say that I have been in many of the city facilities. The library, for one, has always required wearing masks. Um, I do attend Spinnaker Rec on a regular basis to use the gym, which we are very thankful for as players um, to be able to play pickleball there. Um, I do think that the staff at city facilities needs to um, educate all of its citizens who might not want to wear a mask um, and I think education is key. I know that um, a gym is a very difficult um, facility to monitor, um, but I think education is key here. I appreciate your recommending this mass mandate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. Last up will be Martha Wassel, who spoke previously. Thank you for your patience, Martha. Good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm here this evening as a representative from Wentworth Douglas Hospital and the MGB Enterprise, Mass General Brigham, that is. And um, I'm the former health officer of the town of Greenland. As such, I am here, um, and I do need to say that my opinion does not necessarily reflect the position of MGB. Um, but we are seeing a vertical curve, um, meaning that the exponential increase in cases over the last two weeks has stretched our capacity at Wentworth Douglas and the other New Hampshire hospitals to um, a level that we have never seen before. Um, there were some arguments earlier uh, in this presentation that I listened to with the speakers uh, saying that Omicron was not nearly as virulent, and that is true. However, with that vertical curve and the increased number of cases, we will see, if we look at the proportion, that the number of hospitalizations and the number of deaths will likely be equivalent, if not greater, than with the other variants that we have come across. We continue to see severely ill individuals in our hospital. In addition, we're seeing um, the identification of, um, of COVID-19 infection while patients are within the hospital staying for other illnesses and other reasons. And this, um, although we're not caring for a critically ill individual, stresses the resources, requires special air handling in the rooms, and personal protective equipment. This slows down the nursing care in these inpatient departments. Staff, hundreds of staff are out sick right now. They are a cross section of our community and they, although are protected with universal masking within the walls of the hospital, do not have that sort of protection outside of the walls of the hospital. And we're seeing altered surgical schedules, services closed, shortened schedules, and even today we had to completely close our express care because we didn't have enough staff. If there's any mitigation measures in the community, including Portsmouth, that can occur, it should be done, and we would appreciate consideration of doing so. We've been using a universal masking policy since the beginning of COVID at Wentworth Douglas Hospital, and we've experienced close to zero transmission using that universal masking, which is both the source and the recipient wearing masks. 
Both are important because neither are perfect. I'm asking um, for consideration of this by the council and I appreciate the, um, the decisions that have been moved uh, along so far. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Martha. That will end the public comment. Um, I await a motion. Uh, if there is one to be given uh, before we end the meeting. Your Honor, I have a motion. Okay. Councillor Denton. Your Honor, I motion to ratify the January 7th Public Health Directive on face coverings and hold the first reading of the prior mass ordinance at the January 24th City Council meeting. If there's a second, I'll gladly speak to it. Second. So this motion would accomplish two things. The first is it would show our support for the city manager and the health officer's leadership on this issue. It would also address a number of the concerns which were brought up um, during the public comment session. Any discussion? Councilor Murrow. Um, I guess maybe more of a question than a discussion. So um, if we ratify the directive, but then schedule for a hearing to uh, reenact, how many uh, votes is that gonna take and how many meetings in which to be able to do the second part? Yeah, the uh, simple majority in both cases. No, I'm thinking how many meetings? How many meetings? How many, oh, how many, how many meetings. readings meetings? The ordinance will, take, <laughs> ordinance will take three readings. Three meetings. So we'd have to do the full three meetings. Councilor Blaylock. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, is it correct that we could suspend the rules and have the second and third reading at the, at the same meeting? You can suspend the rules at second reading so that second and third reading can occur at the same night. That's the shortest you can make it. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Bagley has his hand up there. Councilor Bagley. Uh, yeah, I, I have a couple comments. Um, and finally, a question. I just I want to thank everybody that came out tonight to speak. Uh, I want to speak to some of the comments that were said. Um, I, I personally have a comorbidity. I have pretty severe asthma and some lung issues. So I was denied. My pulmonologist put me in for um, monocle antibodies, but I was denied because there's a shortage of those right now. So those are the types of decisions that are being made um, about the quality of care that people have. Um, the other thing somebody was uh, mentioned to me, a few few people out there, that if you have them, the K95s and the N95s, and I think somebody mentioned this in their comments, are far superior to the other masks. And with this Omicron variant, if, if you have a, a better mask, it's really worthwhile to wear it. Um, I also want to reiterate that I fully support the decision that was made by the city manager and the health officer. Um, I have questions about, you know, what we can do to to back it up, but I wouldn't want anybody out there to think that I didn't fully support it. The other two anecdotal things I'll say is, you know, when my daughter returned to the high school after winter break, she came home and said, Dad, you know, most of the high school is missing. The, the numbers are just astounding out there. Um, and, and, you know, you know the, the impact of what's happening right now, I know one of the speakers mentioned they wanted to hear Portsmouth numbers. I believe the number today is 406 active cases. Um, that's double what our worst numbers were uh, a year ago. So so the numbers are really off the charts and, and that's not a great thing. And then uh, finally, uh, in regards to the local businesses and restaurants, I have a daughter who's 14 and works as a hostess at a restaurant in town one day a week. So, you know, she's in this position of enforcing the mask mandate. And I, as a parent and as a citizen of Portsmouth, feel much more comfortable that she's doing that. Um, with the city backing her up and she can point to the city and say, this is what the city requires. Uh, I think that puts her in a better position. And then finally, the question I have um, for the, the city manager, I, I guess it would be is, do we have numbers on the attendances at schools and in particularly the students, but also the teachers? I know we recently raised the rate for substitute teachers, which leads me to believe that we're having a hard time keeping the schools open because of absences due to the variant. Um, is there, is there any data on, on what kind of numbers of absences we're seeing in the school system right now that we could we could hear? Mr. Mayor, can I speak to that? 
Mayor, are you okay if I speak yep. Thank you. Um, I spoke with Superintendent Zadervek today. Uh, I, I should say we exchanged e emails. Um, he shared with me that the school uh, system has been running higher student absences since the break with approximately 10 to 15 percent of students absent with the increase attributed to COVID. I guess the somewhat good news is, is that uh, the schools are slightly better this week, closer to the 10 percent absent mark than they were last week, which was closer to 15 percent. In the same vein, staff absences are also higher. Uh, and as you noted, the school department, the school um, department uh, looked to increase their substitute teacher rates this week to attract additional substitute teachers. That strategy seems to have worked in the sense that it has produced a new group of um, applications for folks who would like to, to get involved with that. So the school department is hopeful that uh, this effort, along with the creative work of principals, will keep continuity for students in the classroom. So that's what I have from the, from the vantage point of the schools. Thank you for that uh, data. And I, I just, I guess I would reiterate, you know, this mass mandate may let us do the most important thing, which I, I think, in, you know, other than health and safety is keeping our schools open. You know, keeping our schools open is critical for so, so many reasons. And, you know, it's a small inconvenience to ask that people mask up so that we can get through this, hopefully short time period. And in, in the end of January, end of February, you know, we go back to a little bit more normal times. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bagley. Councilor Cook? No. Uh, Assistant Mayor. Um, I would just like to reiterate as a small business owner that's front facing, we have a large population of people that come into Portsmouth every day, along with residents that you know, don't have the luxury of being able to work from behind their computer or from their offices or from their homes. And these people, and I speak a lot about the restaurant world and the retail world, also work in jobs a lot of times that don't give them the luxury of sick pay and don't give them the luxury of vacation pay. And so it is important that when we, when we look at things like the mask mandate that we are making sure that we're thinking about all residents. And we're, when we're thinking about the people that, you know, a lot of times are the blood and the sweat of our community that keep us going. And so I just wanted to voice that that it's one of the reasons I really support this mix, m the mask mandate. And, you know, as a, as a downtown business operator, one that is front facing, that's open almost 365 days a year, um, I can tell you that the people that I see are, you know, the residents I talk to on a daily basis are in support of this. I've had multiple people come up to me and again, thank us and thank the city, um, the city manager and that health officer um, for doing this because it's it's un, it's an uncomfortable reality that we live in right now. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Thanks, Assistant Mayor. Council Morrow. I just wanted to add some of the statistics because someone had brought up wanting to know why we're doing this. And I think the, the solemn statistics of the percentage of Portsmouth compared to New Hampshire and Rockingham County uh, for between December 21st and January 11th, uh, we've gone from 8.6% to 27.7%, which is a higher percentage than both Rockingham and New Hampshire. And the cases went from 86 to, as of January 11, 327, and it's now gone up to even over four. So I think that that are the numbers that I think the residents need to understand we are looking at in order to make this decision. I have a quick question uh, for the city attorney. Um, by making any, uh, I want to clarify something, by uh, making any, um, I guess, move to an ordinance, are we as a council uh, undermining the uh, power of which to make a, uh, a directive, a health directive from the, uh, the health director? Uh, Your Honor, I do not believe so. I think, in fact, that the uh, health officer's directive and an ordinance could coexist. And uh, what we would do in any particular situation to apply the stricter of the two provisions. Okay. We will have a, uh, a roll call vote, but uh, before we do, I want to thank uh, everybody that came out tonight um, that spoke. Uh, there was a number of people that disagreed with what we're doing. Um, and yet respected the rules of this chamber. I want to thank uh, those people uh, for being respectful of, of uh, 
the council, but I, th I think the city of, of Portsmouth, um, uh, it's a difficult situation that we find ourselves in tonight. Again, um, I would echo the, the, uh, the comments of uh, former Mayor Beckstead in, in stating that this is not something that I would have expected uh, nor uh, wish upon us as a council. Uh, it is difficult. Uh, much of the comments that I have received over the past week uh, have been directed around uh, the legality of the direction that we have taken. I fully support our ability as a, as a, a council uh, and as city manager government for city government uh, to work uh, at the speed of which it needs to protect us. But I do think the discussion that will henceforth come uh, from uh, bringing this uh, ordinance back on uh, can only improve uh, what we have uh, in front of us. That's always been my experience as we've discussed and debated. Uh, the work gets better, and, and I look forward to the conversation out of the nine uh, on the 24th uh, for the first reading. Uh, so with that, uh, can we have the vote? Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councillor Tabor? Yes. Councillor Denton? Yes. Councillor Morrow? Yes. Councillor Bagley? Yes. Councillor Lombardi? Yes. Councillor Blaylock? Yes. Councillor Cook? Yes. And Mayor McEachern? Yes. Pass is 9 0. So with that, we're going to take a 10-minute recess uh, and start back up at 7.30 for the work session. I hope everybody continues to tune in on uh, our uh, audit committee uh, and look forward to that. Thank you, Portsmouth, and stay safe.
going to call to order this uh, work session of the City Council, uh, focusing on the audit uh, committee. I just want to uh, first uh, thank all the work that's going in uh, to the audit uh, committee. I was proud uh, on the last council that uh, we saw a, a need to, to bring the public into the idea of, of how things are happening. And I think that's always a good thing um, to have better clarity on, on all the issues of, of city government, but especially uh, how we spend uh, the money of the citizens of Portsmouth. So I'm excited uh, by that. I thought the discussion to get to this place with the NADA committee uh, was, a, uh, was, was a fantastic discussion, one that um, went on a very long time, but uh, in the end resulted in uh, something that is uh, positive for the city. Um, and that can highlight the great work that I feel our city does um, in terms of delivering uh, the finances uh, to the citizens of Portsmouth. So uh, especially that this is happening before uh, we enter budget season, I think it's a, a good um, induction to what we're going to be spending the next uh, kind of three months, uh, well, actually, no, six months on and uh, yeah, three months. Um, and I, I couldn't be more excited uh, about that. So I'm going to pass it uh, on to the city manager uh, to say a few words, and then we're going to go through uh, presentations, um, questions and answers. And that's, you know, through everybody at the table here, questions and answers, uh, then public comment, uh, where we will continue to have at every meeting the ability to have public comment, um, and then uh, we'll break from there. So uh, city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we are happy to be here, and really this marks the first time that we're holding or, or we're jointly working together to hold a work session uh, for the purpose of discussing the audit process in general and, and in this case as it relates to the most recently completed audit. And we are, appreciate the opportunity to shine a light on this whole process and so that the City Council and the Audit Committee will get to know the process in a more informal and informative way. Uh, we just thought it was, would give a, a lot greater give and take. Uh, typically, you may recall that this has always been a very short presentation in a regular council meeting, just kind of moving things along. And we wanted to slow down and spend it, some concerted effort and time on this topic. So tonight, our, our finance director, Judy Belanger, will set the stage with the uh, annual comprehensive financial report and popular an uh, annual financial report. And then she'll turn things over to Principal Alina Korzak of Melanson, who will walk you through a brief presentation on what the audit firm has found. So, Judy, I'll, take, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Sorry, I just really quickly, I don't know if this is an order of procedure, but do we have, um, we don't have to call roll uh, for this, but are there uh, other members on the Zoom that were previously not on? I just want to be aware of that. We still have the four counselors, and we have a handful of attendees as well. Okay. And, we, uh, and a reminder that at a work session, we don't take any action. Yeah. We just discuss a topic. And uh, Christopher White from the Audit Committee uh, is here in attendance uh, as well. Sorry okay, no problem, thank you. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, Chair White from the Audit Committee. Um, thanks for having us here to uh, uh, talk about the audit. And I just wanted to make a, a couple comments before um, we jump into the audit itself. Um, and really for the public to understand what the documents that we have out there. Um, oftentimes, you're going to hear us refer to GFOA or Government Finance Officers Association. And the City of Portsmouth has been a member of these associations for 30 plus years. Uh, GFOA represents public finance officials throughout the United States and Canada. And their mission is to um, advance excellence in public finance through award programs and training. Um, in seminars, and in addition to the national organization, there's also a New England sector, GFOA sector, and a New Hampshire GFOA sector, and we belong um, to those all three organizations. So the Finance Department will attend lots of seminars and training um, to be in compliance with in recommendations from GFOA. Um, you have before you um, the June 30th, 2021 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report that now we refer to as the ACFRA, um, as well as the popular annual financial report known as the PAFRA. Uh, the city participates in the GFOA award programs for both of these documents as well as our budget presentation 
um, documents and we utilize guidelines and recommendations for best practices while we repair, uh, create these reports. The guidelines promote comprehensive information in addition, addition to the legal required information that we have to do, um, but they also promote transparency and uniformity amongst all the agencies across the country. So for instance, in the comprehensive financial report, if you were to pick up a document from another agency across the country, it's pretty much formatted in the same way so that you could do some comparisons through other um, agencies throughout the country. This information is also very important um, to your citizens about the financial stability of your, of your city, um, also looked at by your investors, and also the participation in these award programs is looked very favorably upon for the rating companies. Um, with that said, Alina is going to explain more detail of the ACFA, but what I would like to introduce to you tonight in more detail is the PAFA report. This is an unaudited report, but it's, it's prepared at the same time as the ACFA report. And as the ACFA report or the financial statements can be very complex to understand, uh, GFOA had promoted this program to really um, make the document very easy, simple to read. It's a summary. It extracts information from your financial statements and really information that's really more informative to your citizens and, and for people who may not have that financial background. Um, in addition to this report, we also add um, different highlights in the report from the different departments. It provides information on how to stay connected with your city government. It has some economic indicators, statistical data, a budget process, accolades, and awards. Um, this year, the publication has two spotlight articles. We try to pick something new that we did um, throughout the year as a spotlight. There's one article in here for major water and sewer projects and the other on the opening of the senior activity center. So we print hard copies because GFOA likes to have the hard copies out. We have some at the library, we have some here in the Portsmouth room, and we're gonna be putting some in at the Senior Activity Center. However, the best way to read this report is online because the report is an interactive document. So with a click of a mouse, as you flip the pages, you can highlight any of the links, articles to the accolades, um, and departments, contact people. So you can click your mouse and move around that document. It will bring you to different websites. Um, some of the, the two highlights that we put in here this year um, is two of the YouTube videos that the stormwater department put in there. So there's pictures in here. You can click the pictures and you'll be brought to one video for dog owners for the do's and don'ts on how to dispose your uh, dog waste in uh, starring our city attorney Bob <laughs> Sullivan <coughs> and the other YouTube video is about how to combat and take care of your falling leaves in the fall and that is starring your deputy finance director Andrew Cargill. So um, I just wanted to highlight that there is a tutorial on the website also that will help people learn how to navigate this document. So I encourage everyone to, to you know Go through it, take a peek, and um, and if anybody does want a hard copy and can't find one, just reach out to me. We'll make sure somebody gets one. So, um, with that said, I can now turn it over to Alina Korsak from Melanson. Thank you, Judy. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council, Chair of the Audit Committee. I'm here, uh, as Judy said, Alina Korsak. I'm the principal in charge of your independent financial statement audit, and I'm going to go over the results of your audit for the year ending June 30, 2021. So our agenda for tonight is to do a brief overview of the fiscal year 21 audit results quickly go over what is the financial statement audit, touch base on independence. I met earlier with the audit committee and some questions were raised about independence. So I thought it would be helpful to put in a few slides just to talk about standards on independence and what we do. And we're going to go into the 
this beautiful document here, the ACRA, some detailed numbers in this report. So starting with a brief overview of the audit results. Once again, the audit was a really smooth process, and once again, the city was very timely. The ACRA was issued in December before the 1231 deadline for submission. As I mentioned, the audit went really well. We did not note any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses that are required to be communicated formally. We did communicate one comment that has nothing to do with significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. All it is is a standard comment, just reminding the city about the upcoming new Gatsby pronouncement number 87, it's on leases. Now what is a financial statement audit? Well, while management's function is to safeguard assets and ensure proper financial reporting, the auditor's function is to provide an opinion on those financial statements. Technically, what it is is just auditors performing procedures to obtain audit evidence about the amounts and disclosures in the financial statements, but that's too technical. On the next slide, we have a few practical examples of what it is. So some of the audit procedures, and this is definitely not an all-inclusive list, though it will, would go on for a long time, but we do transactional testing. We stand for vendor, payroll, journal entries. Part of the transactional testing involves the procurement testing, which involves sampling of contracts. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, that looks like oh, it's a, a little overlapping online. Well, I'll continue. We do reconciliation testing, so we make sure that every key balance sheet accounts, cash receivables is all reconciled, and we test those reconciliations. Walkthroughs, that's what we call our documentation of internal controls over various cycles, like the treasury, the tax collection, and the general legend closing cycle. We do also evaluate the policies procedures that the city has as a whole. And we obtain an understanding of checks and balances that are present within the city as part of us documenting internal controls at the city. And some of the other procedures we do is we obtain and test actuarial reports, we do the same with debt documents, we review claims, legal documents, and I guess the big thing that I wanted to say um, what an audit is, is we review all funds that the city has and we test all material account balances and we use a sampling plan uh, when required by auditing standards. Now what is independence and the importance of independence? So for all the clients, we also perform non-attest services. And whenever we do a financial statement audit and non-attest services, we are required to document that we are independent. And I put some citations here on where the standards come from, but they come from AICPA Code of Professional Conduct, as well as Chapter 3 of the Governmental Auditing Standards, which is commonly known as the Yellow Book. And they establish professional standards and guidance on how to maintain independence and how to, how we, and that, that is the reason we are able to provide non-attest services is because we um, annually document on how we maintain an independence. So annually we do certification of all employees. What that means is uh, in our formal HR documents, employees go review all the client list and they certify and sign off that there are no potential conflicts or anything that may impair independence. And we apply the safeguards that are outlined in GATLAS, which means uh, governmental accounting, uh, generally accepted governmental accounting, um, uh, governmental auditing standards. And that is basically the same as it's yellow book. It's, it's commonly known as yellow book. So we apply sa safeguards as required by GAGAS or the yellow book. And part of that really includes just um, putting back the child balances back to the city, any ent entries that have to be proposed, that's all reviewed uh, by the city. So we provide it right back and they review it and that's part of the standards and additionally, we do uh, what's called an independence checklist, and we fill it out for the city of Portsmouth every year. Uh, our team fills it out, and some of the things that is included in there is the 
evaluation of the skill, knowledge, and experience of the people at the city that take responsibility for these non-attest services. We do have a process of rotating principals and staff on the job on as needed basis. For example, I am the fourth principal in charge for the city of Portsmouth audit, and we also had complete audit team turnovers uh, multiple times uh, since we've been doing the audit for the city of Portsmouth. And I thought some statistics would be helpful just so you know how widespread this is in New England. So out of my 19 clients, only one prepares their own financial statements. We have a few other governmental audit principals at Melanson, and none of their clients uh, prepare their own financial statements. And uh, some of the reasons is basically just cost efficiency. The clients find that it's a uh, cost effective for them to do these non-attest services uh, by the same firm as is doing their financial statement audit. And then I thought a sample of client work would be helpful. Um, so I just want to say we successfully been performing audit engagements with our clients and non-attest services for them and maintaining longevity with our clients. And uh, in this table, where it says ACRA word, uh, yes means they do prepare one, and uh, the number of years is the approximate number of years that they have received the excellence in, in financial reporting certificate. And then the last column here is the approximate number of years that uh, a firm, Melanson, has been their auditor. And then we're going to go into the overview of the CAP, ACRA. So, as Judy mentioned, the city has been doing this great program for a long time. They've gotten uh, the award for the excellence in financial reporting from GFOA for fiscal year 88, 89, and then 26 consecutive years from 95 to all the way to 2020. The reason the fiscal year 2021 is not here yet is because it, it gets submitted in December, but we typically don't hear anything back till at least the summertime. So that's going to take a while. <clears throat> so going through the ACRA format, it starts with an introductory section, so which includes the transmittal letter. Now that uh, transmittal letter that you have here in the introductory section is not audited. It's provided by management. And then in the financial section, it follows with the auditor's report. We provided an unmodified report, and what that means is we did not need to do any modifications to your financial statements to make them be in conformance with GAAP, or generally accepted accounting principles. Follows is the MDNA, the management discussion and analysis. That is all your financial highlights, summaries, any, any type of um, important thing to note and to highlight it goes into the MDNA. That is also unaudited and provided by management. And I should mention the page number. So the transmittal letter is page one in this document. And auditor's report is page 23. And MDNA is pages 26 through 38. So after the MDNA, we have uh, what we call the government-wide financial statements. Those are on a cruel basis of accounting. And after that, there is fund financial statements. And those are on modified accrual basis of accounting for governmental funds, but accrual basis for enterprise funds. And then you have notes in the financial section. And the last section here is the statistical section. And that's a really great section because it really provides your readers with a, a historical background on how the city performed by reporting multi-year data. And the statistical section is also unaudited and provided by management. So we'll go into some of these details here. So an important, of course, um, page is the budget versus actual comparison for the, your main fund, you know, your general fund. And this here is a summary table on a budgetary basis. So we see that the revenues exceeded budget by about $2.5 million. Uh, the biggest one was the license and permits and 1.3 million, and most of that was motor vehicle registrations about 800,000. So the budget versus actual page is 48. And then if you look, uh, if you want to see what cost the, these uh, accesses, you go to page 34 in the MDNA. 
and that explains uh, it in more detail. So like the expenditures, uh, there's unspent of 1.5 million. The biggest department was police this year of 415,000. Um, and of course there are other departments not as big, including community services. And you guys know there's been some vacancies, you know, recreational program cancellations and various things like that due to COVID. So the, the net amount uh, that came as a budgetary surplus was 4.5. $1 million. And then on the following page, we have the general fund, unassigned fund balance, which is also important because you guys have a policy which is described in your MDMA on page 32, talks more about it. You can get this unassigned fund balance from the balance sheet, general fund balance sheet, which is page 44, and then MDNA page 32 has write ups on it. So the policy is 10 to 17 percent of appropriations. <clears throat> And, and this is a great slide because you can see you're right in the middle of that uh, at 13.74 percent. And this is also great because you could see how consistent you've been annually. And then we'll go into bonds and loans payable for the last five years as well. Now those in, in the notes section on page 72. Uh, so here we see not much of a change because uh, there was a refinance in some SRF, special development fund programs as well for water sewer, but the debt remained um, consistent with just a slight increase from 20 to 21. Now manageable is actually a good term by uh, Standard and Poor's and that's your rating agency because uh, you're rated, that's one of the reasons you are rated highly. It's considered uh, a credit, uh, like a factor, a positive credit factor. It, it tells, it says that you have adequate debt profile which is a positive and one of the descriptions for that is a note here at the bottom, which is more than 71% of your principal is going to retire within 10 years. A and that's a great factor. Then they'll go to pension. Now, although pension looks like it jumped a lot, and, and it did, but just to keep in mind, uh, you have a share of New Hampshire retirement system. Your share is 1.95%. And the reason it says 630.20 here and again, I'm sorry um, why on the screen it overlaps. It's not like that on the print. But the reason it says 6320 because it's just based on prior year measurement date. Um, now, there were some benefit changes, but the biggest thing that contributed to that was a, a big assumption change, and that's a discount rate change. It didn't just change by a quarter point. It changed by a whole half a point. So, so I see the note here um, that the discount rate dropped uh, from 7.25 all the way down to 6.75, which is the biggest reason why your share of the New Hampshire time and system liability uh, went so much uh, higher than the year before. And those are really the key numbers in your ACRA. And the reports that we really issue is an opinion in the financial section that it's an opinion on your financial statements. However, it's important to point out that we do not express an opinion on um, like internal controls. Also in the CAFRA, we do, we do not, uh, ACRA I should say, we do not express an opinion on the introductory letter, statistical se section, like, as I mentioned before, um, management discussion and analysis. We also don't express an opinion on RSI, and what, what that is, required supplemental information, is uh, that's pretty much your, uh, all your pension schedules, all your OPEP schedules, the, the data we get from um, actuaries and, and place it all in here. That's, um, the, it's basically what financial statement audit is. It, it's, uh, it's an audit on, on financial statements, but it's not, but we don't opine on, on our side on those like pension and OPEP schedules. Now we also issued a governance letter uh, to you guys and it's just standard communication. All it said was is like we did not have any material corrected misstatements, we did not have any disagreements with management, we did not have anything like, you know, significant for you to report. There was a significant accounting principle change, GASB 84, which the city implemented really nicely. Um, and that's noted there that there was a significant change in accounting, but 
there's nothing for us uh, to report to you where we came into like any type of difficulty. Um, so the management letter, as I mentioned, it, just one certain comment, and that's the next guess that's going to be implemented, the 632.22, which is 87. And um, that base, oh, I should mention, though, the single audit report, the reason that's not in here is because it has, that process hasn't started yet. Uh, the single audit report is due March 31st, and due to COVID, it got <coughs> extended to September 30th. So we still plan to issue, you know, but uh, by March 31st, but you know, it's up to the city and the, that extension is out there. So there is an extension out there uh, through September 30th. And, and the single audit is um, the audit of the grants, the federal grants. Oh, thank you, yeah. Judy. <laughs> Thanks, that was important to note. Um, and basically that's all for the reports that we issued or to be issued, like the pending single audit report. And that basically concludes my presentation, so I'm going to turn it back to you to see if there are any thank questions you. or comments. Thank you. Alina and Pastor, thanks on to Melanson for the work uh, that, that you've put into this. Uh, at this point, we will entertain questions of the, the council uh, and the member of the, or the chair of the audit committee here. Are there any questions? Councillor? Uh, I have. Oh, hold on. Uh, Councillor Moreau. Oh, <clears throat> this might be a, a stupid question, so you can tell me if it is. Um, there is no you such talk, thing. <laughs> you talk about checks and balances, and I've sat through some audits for some nonprofits that I've sat on, and I guess I'm just looking for examples of what those checks and balances are, so we ensure that you know you're just looking at everything to make sure, God forbid, someone was stealing or something like that. So could you give mm -hmm. us an example of, of a checks and balance? Absolutely. So as I mentioned, we don't a pine on that. We just, what's required for financial statement that is just to get an, a doc, document uh, understanding of it. And uh, a good example would be, for example, payroll, um, HR. Like how, how do we document, we document other duties segregated, for example. So if say HR enters pay rates uh, and payroll processes, you know, that's a good thing. But if payroll does both, well, that's technically considered uh, not a segregation of duty. So we would go further, and if that is the case, for example, then we would follow with the city and say, well, what mitigating factors do you have in place? Um, you know, because this is, this is a breakdown in segregation of duties. So it's just different areas. So like a vendor um, cycle would be a, a similar situation. Say if the, if, if the vendor person uh, runs, the vendor clerk runs, processes all the registers and approves of all that segregation of duties issue. Like so, so, so we basically, that segregation of duties is a big thing when it comes to uh, checks and balances. Um, so anytime we see a breakdown, like we would narrow in and, and see, see what, what's um, happening to, to resolve that. But, um, but it's done by all different cycles, like financial reporting cycle, which is journal entries, there's treasury, there's collections. So, so at every level we document. Great, thank you. All right, and next up I have uh, Councillor Bagley and then Councillor Tabor, who both have their hands up, so we'll go to <laughs> Councillor Bagley. Yeah, mine's uh, more of a comment and slight question. On, I, I don't know which page of the document, but where you show the ACFR awards, it looks like the city of Keene, which is I think 23,000, we're 22,000 population, so I think a very co comparable city. Um, you've been doing the audits for them for a uh, long number of years, and they've only won that award three times, and I believe we've won it 28 times. Um, so I guess my comment is that it's like we very regularly win these awards plus the Triple Crown Award. Um, but I, I've heard in the past that other people say, oh, if you're a member of the organization, you automatically get an award. And it, based on what I see in Keene, that certainly doesn't seem to be the case. Could you comment on that? The statistics oh. of what cities receive awards and how regularly they are received? I'm sorry, uh, it kind of broke off a little bit. Are you saying that the city of Keene should be 28, not three? No, I, th I think what uh, Councillor Bagley was pointing out is that our, our domination in terms of winning awards and uh, throwing uh, the good city of Keene under the bus. Uh, why, <laughs> you know, if these are, uh, um, you know, what, what goes into winning an award? What could prevent you from winning an award? 
Um, okay. and, and Councillor Bagley, uh, you did break up, so if I didn't get the the, the spirit of the question. Uh, please please chime in. No, that's perfect. And uh, apologies to Keen. I did live in the area for ten years. <laughs> So uh, a lot of it is the dedication of the the management because the annual comprehensive financial report is a lot bigger than just the basic financial statements. So uh, the dedication of management, they would have to write the introductory section, the statistical section. The statistical section is 10 years worth of information. <coughs> you know that that takes time to compile and um, and it takes time to to write everything about all your accolades, accolades or awards, or your long-term financial planning policies, economic conditions. So it's, it's dedication of staff, uh, r resources, and just mm. how, how much does the city value that this uh, award and, and this program. Uh, we think it, you know, it's a really great program, and we would love for all of our clients to do it. but. Um, uh, but a lot of them, you know, some clients just might not have, like, the skill level, might be a more smaller type of department, might be, um, or they might not. Um, I I've heard one of the clients uh, to telling me that, well, we just don't get recognition for doing that. So it's whatever the reason is, uh, there there's, could be a lot of reasons why they think they they are not gonna go the next step and do a comprehensive one mm -hmm. instead of the basic one. But yeah, there are various reasons. Thank you, uh, Judy, anything to add before we Just go? Just to add to that, um, to Council Bagley, I don't, um, though Keen received three awards, they may have only submitted in the last few years the comprehensive uh, financial report. Um, it's, not a, it's not a requirement to do this, and what Alina was saying is that there is so much more information because just doing regular basic financial statements, you're not going to have the MDNA, you're not going to have the statistical section, you're not going to have the introduction letter. Um, but there is a whole book um, of checklists, and they get reviewed uh, by GFOA. We don't know who the reviewers are. They, they differ every year. And then they submit comments, and, and if you don't get the award, it's because you didn't hit the certain criteria that's in their checklist um, and, and comprehensive enough for the award. So it doesn't, because you submit it does not mean that you're going to get the award. Um, so we work diligently to make sure that we do all our checks and balances in the finance department as well. Thank you. Councillor Tabor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> Elena, I just wanted to get a little more color on how often the team changes that does our audits. Um, you know, it's a city council responsibility to make sure the audit is is taken care of. It's we, we oversee that, and <clears throat> having fresh eyes to come in and look at the city's books, I think is beneficial. Um, can you just comment on? Uh, how how many of the team each year are are coming at it fresh oh yes of course so um going back i recall when this is frank byron then john sullivan and scott mcintyre and then now me since 2019 so i've been the principal for two years on this the audit team that's been working on the city of portsmouth audit for june 2021 um, they have not been on the audit for more than three years, so really it seems um, it, it seems pretty fresh. Um, we currently don't have anybody on the team that's been involved for a very long time. Um, okay, and one more question, if I could. Um, <clears throat> maybe this is for Judy as well. Uh, in looking at the city's financial position, are we pretty comfortable that the pension liability is funded uh, that we have to do uh, as part of the state plan? Or do we ever look at whether it's underfunded and whether that could come back uh, to us in future? You want to, I can answer some. I mean, okay. so there's, um, so those numbers of that liability comes from 
um, their studies and their assumptions. So whatever we're provided is what we have to book. Um, one of the reasons why our um, pension like went up drastically last year during the budget process is because that's 70 percent of our retirement rate actually is funding that liability. So in theory, if you know we're like 10 years into um, the program, I think it was a 30 year um, liability that was shared amongst all the communities and we're like 10 years into there. Theoretically, that liability should deplete, deplete, deplete as time goes on. Um, and, but if that gets adjusted by the rates in order to, to fund that liability. So we kind of do it as a pay as you go, so to speak. Um, but we are obligated, um, and I can't remember what GASB number that was, but we're obligated to book that liability on our accrual mm -hmm. basis. Yes, and, and that was GASB 68 started in fiscal 15. If you look at page 96, you'll see that the New Hampshire retirement system is 58.72% funded at 6-30-21, but it's based on the previous year, measurement date 6 30 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Denton. Thank you, Your Honor. Do any of the 10 other New Hampshire communities that were listed have their own audit committees? And if so, have they had any impact on that community's rating? Uh, well, there's one here that has an audit committee and no, it had no impact on rating Not in all. New Hampshire though. I think he was asking New Hampshire. Oh, yeah. I, and that whole list, uh, there's one town here that I'm not a principal in charge. Um, so uh, none of mine. So none of the ones I work on have audit committees. And uh, when I read reports, like City of Portsmouth S&P report or anybody else's Moody's or whatever the rating agency is, Audit committee has, I've never seen audit committee mentioned in those reports. Um, they typically rate it on their, you know, credit strength, like, like debt profile and reserve, how many reserves they have in, in their fund balance, so what their budget flexibility is, what, what, you know, demographics, things like that. Um, how good are their policies and procedures? Are they strong? And, but I've never seen anything um, listed about audit committee, so I don't think it has any impact on rating. Councillor Denton, any other questions? Councillor Cook. I have an unusual question. I don't know if you can answer it for me. Um, are we seeing any specific trends in the state equalization uh, measure? Like, do we know how, do we expect that percentage to increase for Portsmouth over the next year? Do we do we expect what to increase? Um, the equalization measure that the state does every year for contributions to Rockingham County. And um, have we seen any trends? So um, it's kind of a hard question to answer. Uh, the calculation for equalization is prepared by the Department of Revenue um, with the values, you know, market value continually rising. Um, then, you know, we have had an equalization net assessment that has gone up, you know, pretty much every year. And I think that's kind of the trend across the board. Um, so we expect, because they, what they try and do in an equalization is they, you know, try to compare it for apples to apples amongst other communities. Um, so the equalization value that's placed on is not our actual local value uh, within our city. So our ratio might be lower, but the, what they're doing, if our ratio is lower, they're gonna bring all the ratios up to it to a certain degree. So, you know, markets increase over, you know, over time. I don't know if that, eh. It helps, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm looking kind of in comparison to Rockingham County, because I know valuations have increased across Rockingham County as yes. well. Yes. And we're seeing those valuations even increasing um, much further uh, west in Rockingham County, so I didn't know if if that was impacting somehow our percentage in equalization and therefore impacting our budget. Um, 
it, because it compares all up, it, it almost makes it all level amongst the communities, um, but it will impact the Rockingham County tax proportionment among Rock Rockingham County. Thank you. Any other questions uh, as it pertains to the audit auditor as, as we have her here uh, this evening? Councilor Blaylock. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Alina, I'd like to ask, do you see any benefit in having an audit committee, um, as, you know what I mean, as a, in addition to the audit? Do you see <clears throat> a benefit, any benefit from your point of view? I <laughs> Just ask your person, professional opinion, not, not uh, I, I don't, well, it's not, not a benefit in my opinion, but it's really up to you, not really the auditor, if you want to. I guess maybe a better question would be, um, are you used to dealing, I said you have, and most of these other communities do not have an audit right. committee, right? So I, it's not something you're used mm -hmm. to. No, right. so I am only used to dealing with um, the, the, the clients that I'm the principal in charge. Yep. I only have one client, and it's not in New Hampshire, it's in Massachusetts. Okay. They do submit an ACFRA, um, and they have an audit committee, and, but all I, they just have one meeting um, after I uh, produce the draft mm -hmm. to go through the, the draft financial statements, uh, the ACFRA and the management letter. I, I, that's my only dealings with an audit committee yeah. on an annual basis. It's just that one town in Massachusetts out of my 19 clients. So I am not um, used to dealing with them. So, yeah. I mean, it's really up to you guys whether you want to appoint someone to a committee to appoint an auditor, but, but it's not, not, yeah, not something I'm used to. Okay, thank you. Well, one benefit is that we're having this work session today and talking about it and bringing it to uh, the public to understand a little bit more and hopefully through mm -hmm. understanding the audit, uh, there's strength in how we, how we uh, uh, appropriate uh, monies in the city of Fort Smith and we can better understand the process behind that and there's you know, more strength mm -hmm. that uh, the, the citizens will then uh, put into us. So, um, if, uh, Chairman? Well, thank Chris. you. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor. Mm, thank uh, you. I had a couple of questions okay. for you, please. Following on Councillor Tabor's uh, questions on the uh, retirement benefits, mm -hmm. uh, do these uh, do the expenses that are on uh, on your page for net pension liability? Does that also include health care costs? So this is just the net pension liability. This does not include the medical subsidy for New Hampshire retirement system. So the city has, uh, the city's open plan is uh, very small. It's mostly implicit subsidy. And therefore, we, I did not even include a slide on it. I believe the liability is only 13 million. And then the New Hampshire retirement system medical subsidy, I believe that one is 8 million. So your total OPEP liability, which is for health insurance, is only 21 million. And I think you, if you, and I can check that by looking at this financial statement section, page 41. So your total OPEP liability is only 20, one million. So, uh, comparing to the net pension liability of 124 million, I, I did not even include a slide on that uh, because uh, because your city plan is it's mostly implicit subsidy. That's the liability. The, uh, we did talk. You did mention the drop in the discount rate, which is important. Yes. Uh, what other factors do you see uh, changing in the next coming uh, few years? for instance, assumed rates of inflation uh, that will impact these uh, it costs. For the New Hampshire retirement system, for the pension one? Yes. And sorry, if I could just interject quickly, could you explain the discount rate for those falling at home? Oh, of course. So the discount rate is uh, basically uh, supposed to be an equivalent of the long-term rate of return on investments, and it's supposed to be like 20, 30 years, meaning way in the future. So. Um, if, if the financial uh, if advisors are not predicting a high rate of return in the future, you want to be conservative and you want to reduce your what's called the discount rate. So um, 
lately the trend in pensions across the country has been um, reducing the discount rate by a quarter of a point. So we're where in the past few years ago, we've seen some discount rates of like eight, eight and a half percent. Well, they've been decreasing them typically by a quarter point a year to get to something that's say no more than 7%, like something between six and seven. And the New Hampshire retirement system, I believe they were doing it slowly at first, maybe like by a quarter of a point, but this past year they did it by a whole half a point. Now, even the slightest change in discount rate, uh, which is the, long-term rate of return rate on investments, um, even the slightest change causes a huge jump in liability because you look at the investment portfolio and if you're not predicting that it's gonna be making gains as much, then your net position in your pension fund is gonna be so much lower. So you're gonna be less funded and that net pension liability is gonna be a lot higher. Thank you and sorry, uh, Chairman White for Asking that, jumping in on your. Sure. So, uh, so what other inputs do you foresee uh, changing significantly, such as rates of inflation, that well, will have I, an impact? I'm expecting the actual contributions that you're going to be contributing to for this New Hampshire time system. Uh, I'm thinking those are going to be increasing mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I I don't expect much in changes in like benefits. So. They did a, a change in benefits. It's disclosed in, in the financial statements here, um, but I don't. We don't usually see that. Um, but th the, the biggest one would be the discount rate. If if it drops again, um, we, and the accounting is different than the funding. So the, there's GASB 68, which promulgates the accounting for this net pension liability. The funding is not necessarily um, at the same rate. So that's because there's a funding schedule. There, um, there, so based on actuarial funding valuation, and then there's actuarial GASB 68 valuation. And um, so it doesn't mean that like your contributions are gonna go, you know, jump way high up. Um, but I do see them, you know, increasing them to, to get to a more funded ratio because the 58% is not I mean, are you comparing to the country, it's not considered like that well funded. So I do see contributions going up to, to get it up a bit. And no estimates in terms of what we face in terms of higher contributions. I'm not sure if there were there are estimates that have been, uh, they typically do it in three year periods. Every two years, yeah. Every two Every years, two years. Okay. And when was the last? The last budget cycle, FY22. So there will be no change in the retirement rate um, when preparing the FY23 budget. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alina, we, uh, at our uh, pre-audit meeting last spring, uh, we had a good discussion on some of the areas in which we could enhance the concept of independence. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them was to somehow deal with these non-attest services. Perhaps you could speak to uh, that as well as some of the other points that you had made? Well, as I mentioned, non-attest services are requiring us to look into independence, but especially in New England, it's just so common uh, for the cities um, to ask their auditor to do the financial state presentation, which is the biggest non-attest service. There are some minor ones like DCF, data collection form, and for some glad and little things, but but the biggest one, financial statement preparation, um, it's, uh, it seems to be like such a common practice here um, in the North Northeast to, to be doing that. Um, so in my opinion, as long as the independence is met and documented properly and we follow standards every year, I don't see an issue with non-attest services. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting because uh, from an industry point of view, from your industry mm -hmm. of auditors, uh, there is some talk amongst people I've spoken with in Massachusetts, for instance, uh, that the regulatory authorities may be looking at that more closely and trying to tighten up the, uh, the idea that the auditor also provides the non-attest services. 
So I'm glad that we're trying to address that this year in the uh, audit services that we're uh, sending out for RFP. Well, the yellow book, uh, the revision I mentioned here is the 2018 revision, and that's the one that um, increased the, the standards for, for independence, like evaluating ski skill, knowledge, and experience. And that just means that um, as long as the person accepting responsibility um, would know enough to identify there's an error, for example, uh, then the, the, they have the skill, knowledge, experience to be taking the responsibility for the document. Um, that came, it was a 2018 revision, which was just became effective this past year. And those are governmental, for 6321, it's the first time. So those are governmental rules. And I know governmental rules, um, you know, I not not exactly the same as the, the commercial rules out there for, for, for um, like, stock companies or, or publicly traded companies or private businesses. And um, so, uh, we follow Yellow Book, and they did make it stricter, but that was effective for 63021. The, uh, do you have any comments on trends that you that you might have observed in our consent agreements in terms of uh, escalating costs uh, of going out over the next oh, five yes. or ten years? Oh yes. And so, what, would, what comments do you have on that? So, you know, interesting question because years ago I actually had um, more um, clients uh, uh, financial statements, but it's just not, not happening right now. I mean, it's hard to find people right now. Um, it's, it's hard to find um, skillful people to add to your, you know, finance department and uh, the staffing has been not as great as in the past, including on our side. So uh, we've lost people too. So the staffing has been difficult. And we've actually sent out letters that we are increasing some audit fees, like 20% um, because, because of this whole um, situation with the labor market. And um, so, yeah, so I definitely foresee costs um, going up because uh, of capacity issues, because of the current labor market and capacity issues. Okay, we have one question from Councillor Bagley, and we can come back. <coughs> yes, thank you. Chairman White. Councillor Bagley? Uh, yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, could you speak to, so if, if we separate out the non-attest surfaces from the audit, what additional cost is the city looking at Roughly, is that a number you would have handy or could report back to us? Well, uh, we're, yeah, I don't think we're up to that point. Correct. Yeah, I mean, I think okay. we're, we have an RFP out for auditing services and, and for, um, so we have no idea what those costs are gonna come in just to do the auditing of the financial statements. <clears throat> Um, so it's it would be hard to predict what that estimate would be right now. Thank you. Chairman White, any other questions? I, I had prepared uh, some comments from the audit committee uh, that I thought were going to be done during public session. So I kept cutting and cutting and cutting until I got down to about three minutes and 30 seconds, uh, oh. <laughs> uh, knowing that the red light was going to go off. Um, but with your permission, I would like to just go through those now, if I may. I would say uh, the, the, the three minutes is a, uh, is a, uh, a gold standard for delivering effective <laughs> comment. If we can <laughs> keep, it to, keep it to that, that's great. Um, but you will not be limited in your time. Uh, here, uh, but by keeping it brief, we keep our attention and keep the words more impactful. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So, um, so I'm uh, delivering these uh, again, expecting that I was going to be standing at the podium. Uh, so please forgive me if it's a little stilted. Um, but uh, so I speak with you uh, as chair of the audit committee in partial fulfillment of the audit committee's duties to advise you, the City Council, 
on the adherence of this audit to Ordinance 1, Spot 414, the Audit Committee, and the City Charter's requirements for an independent audit. There are three points that I'd like to make to you tonight, independent of the Q&A that we just had. Um, what makes an audit independent? In our opinion, why are we not there yet? And how can the City Council fix this problem so that we can achieve that independence? First of all, what makes an audit independent? Financial audits play a vital role in helping to preserve the integrity of public finance and maintain citizens' confidence in their elected leaders, i.e. you, the City Council. Further, investors rely on financial audits to determine the creditworthiness of the municipality. Audits provide independent, underline independent, independent assurance that financial information is reliable. From this very important booklet that I don't know if you can still get because I, I, it may be out of stock at the GFOA, but it's uh, the mayor has a copy. I, I know some city staff have copies of this. This is the uh, GFOA book on audit committees. Uh, Councillor Tabor has a copy. Um, so on page nine in here is a wonderful metaphor uh, for how the relationship is supposed to work between the auditor, the uh, governing body, and city management. So consider, please, this metaphor. The city council is the parent, city management is the student, and the auditor is the teacher. At the end of the day, you, as parent, are responsible for the performance of the student. The teacher is hired to check on whether the student is achieving his goals, and you will want to know what problems the student has had along the way. As parent, you would not want the student to determine what is said to the parent by the teacher. You want the unvarnished truth as parent, of course. Nor should the city council want the auditor to be controlled by city management in what is reported. The teacher and the auditor, to be independent, must be free to report what is observed. So why then, from our observation, why is the audit not independent. Today, the teacher or the auditor checks with the student management to determine what may be said and what may not be reported. Mallinson Heath, our current auditor, has been the only auditor for over 25 years. We've already touched on that. It has uh, that uh, a relationship over that length of period um, invariably means that there's a the arm's length nature of what should be in existence begins to be uh, questioned. So, uh, and not only that, but Mellinson has prepared the financial statements that then audits those so-called non-attest services. For this audit, and already for next year's audit, the audit committee has been sidelined by management a typical audit has the auditor reporting to an audit committee rather than management. Here, the audit committee is excluded and the auditor only reports to management until the audit is polished and complete. This means that any problems the auditor might identify will rarely see the light of day. The audit committee won't know about them and neither will you. How can the City Council fix this problem? First, we would, you would allow the Audit Committee to communicate with respondents to the RFP so that we can fulfill our duty to select the auditor. We're under a gag order not to talk with uh, anyone that's in the uh, considered set of auditors. Allow the Audit Committee to negotiate the contract to fulfill its duty to select the auditor. Right now, we've been forbidden from participating in that negotiation. And then, as the auditor does its work, require the selected firm to communicate 
any issues or problems directly to the City Council's Audit Committee. If the City Council wishes to have the auditor report these matters directly to it, then at least keep us involved to advise you with our expertise and experience. These would be significant steps towards making the audit independent and compliant with your city charter. The audit committee would be happy to meet with the city council, and that would be more than just myself, in a work session to answer questions or elaborate further. So thank you. Thank you, Chairman White. Um, a, it's, always, it's hard to now be the mayor because I, I don't get to talk as much. <laughs> it's easier for everyone else. Um, but I have some thoughts, and before we open up to public comment, uh, I'd, I'd like to say a few words. Uh, again, thank you, Chairman White, for representing the Audit Committee. Uh, thank you, Alina, uh, for the work uh, that you and your firm do on behalf of the City of Portsmouth and for coming here tonight during a pandemic, wading through uh, all of this and, and speaking with us very patiently uh, and answering our questions. It is appreciated. Um, thank you to Judy and Andrew and all the, the city staff uh, for pulling this together uh, and city manager for uh, having this uh, conversation. Just a few points, um, not in uh, direct response to you, uh, Chairman, uh, but in terms of where we are in this process that I see as an audit committee, I very uh, solemnly take the responsibility to, to, to carry out the work of, of city business. I know that decisions that we might make um, have unintended consequences uh, at every turn. Um, so, well, in my maybe my uh, my family life, when I'm when I'm you know uh, when I'm thinking uh, you know with my kids, you know, should we you know go down the, uh, the the bunny slope or should we you know just take them up to the the the, the blue squares and just kind of you know, sink or swim, you know, I might tend towards the, the sink or swim uh, attitude when I am uh, outside of public life. But we took steps to make this a little bit slower process when it came to the audit committee. And I want to remind uh, of the duties and powers, the primary purpose of the audit committee is to recommend an external auditor to the city council. In the event the auditor identifies any serious exceptions, the audit committee shall advise and work with the city council as to next steps. That is slightly curtailed from what I understand and what I remember as the original uh, motion that was before us. And I think it was a good step to take a small step. I hope that the audit committee continues to work in this vein and we figure out what's the best system for the city of Portsmouth ultimately to bring the transparency uh, and understanding of independence. But uh, just two points, indirect uh, uh, response, uh, Chairman White. I think there's a number of towns that, that have had an auditor, uh, Melanson, um, for a number of years. I think it's good that we go to RFP, but I also noticed some that have gone to RFP, gone away and come back. That could be a possibility, and it does not, uh, it does not uh, I, I guess, equal that there is some sort of lack of independence there. And the other is the fiduciary responsibility of the auditing firms to be independent. Um, and just as a lawyer uh, or a doctor uh, has a, a responsibility, I think um, to assume that, uh, that an auditor would be anything less than, than, than independent, I'm not saying that that is what uh, you implied or inferred, uh, but it's, it's bear just repeating that an auditor must be uh, responsible uh, to that. So I look forward to working with you, and I've invited <coughs> to meet uh, with you and, and uh, the audit committee. Uh, I look forward to this council as we go through the budget. Uh, I look forward to, you know, Judy and Andrew continuing to do great work uh, for the city of Portsmouth and win us another award. I want to, I mean, you know, we're, we're hanging banners uh, like the, you know, like the Celtics uh, many years ago. I want to continue to hang banners compared to, you know, other cities that I'm not going to name uh, now because I don't want that in the paper. Um, but I, I, I do uh, appreciate uh, the work and and with that I was going to open to public comment uh, but look forward to working with you Chairman White and the audit committee uh, going forward and thank you uh, Alina again for your time tonight. Thank you Mayor. So as all public meetings we will host public comment is there anybody from the public does not appear to uh, be at this time uh, I want to thank uh, everyone for making our first 
uh, meeting and auspicious occasion, um, but a successful one. Again, thank you, Chairman White, for making yourself available tonight. Thank you, Alina. Thank you. Um, thank you. Look thank forward you. to the work that's ahead. Um, with that, I, uh, I need a motion to enter into non-public to uh, re uh, discuss uh, anticipated non-public session uh, regarding okay? litigation in accordance with RSA 91A3, uh, uh, Section 2E, and RSA 91A, uh, colon 3, uh, Section 2, uh, number 1. Or I. So moved. So moved, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Second. Uh, and we will need a roll call vote uh, for that. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Council Tabor? Yes. Council Denton? Yes. Council Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Laylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Council Thank you, Portsmouth. Good night. Stay safe. Stay warm.